everyone, and welcome to the Uncorked Corner podcast, where we cover the full spread of food and beverage industry topics. My name is Bianca, PR and marketing professional by day and food and wine connoisseur by night. And my name is Nick, an accountant with a passion for barbecue, beer, and whiskey. Today, we welcome Zachary Sussman, author of the new book, The Essential Wine Book. In this episode, Zachary talks to us about the differences between his wine book and other wine reference guides that are available to enthusiasts everywhere, how the regionality of wine can be more important than the style, and some of the staples that are always great to have on your wine shelf. If you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to us. With that said, let's welcome Zachary to the show. Welcome to the podcast. We are so excited today to have Zachary on with us to talk about his new book, but we'll get started by having him introduce himself. Um, Let's have you tell everybody a little bit about your background, how you got into the industry and, you know, what really inspired you to write the book? Yeah. Um, So first of all, thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, You know, I get asked that question a lot and I sort of just fell into it. Um, You know, my background is more in academia. Um, I work uh, in the creative writing program at NYU, um, and I was doing actually um, a graduate degree there, an MFA in poetry, um, and that's when I really got into wine. Um, I was waiting tables at a BYO restaurant in Brooklyn called um, Petite Crevette, and people would bring bottles in, um, and I just started to pay attention um, and kind of developed a geeky habit. And then, you know, I was a writer, so I was lucky enough actually to have um, an editor who was a friend of mine who lived in the neighborhood and I'd bring bottles over for dinner. And eventually she asked me if I would write something for her and it sort of just took off like that. Awesome. Now, why don't you take us a little bit into the book? Uh, Tell us the name of it and everything for all of our listeners. Obviously we have copies here. It looks awesome. It's got a beautiful cover. Uh, It's a nice little size. Great for uh, your home bar or anything, your wine cellar, wherever you want to store it. Uh, So why don't you take us through that a bit? Sure, yeah. Um, So it's called The Essential Wine Book, A Modern Guide to the Changing World of Wine. Um, I wrote it um, for 10 Speed Press in in collaboration with Punch, um, where I'm a columnist. I do a lot of wine writing for them. Um, And so they actually approached me uh, to to write this book. And the idea was really just to create, um, at least this is the way that I thought about it, to create the wine book that I wish existed when I was first getting into wine. Um, So not a um, wine atlas or a wine Bible, but something really user-friendly that um, didn't just like list the facts, but really try to contextualize um, sort of the larger uh, kind of cultural conversation around wine. So, you know, where where do these different regions fit into the larger context? What makes them important? Um, who are the producers uh, sort of um, uh, carrying the, the evolution sort of forward or the conversation forward? Um, so it's really trying to kind of give readers a, almost like a Cliff's Notes guide into modern wine culture. And that's so great because I'll be honest, I'm the person that bought every wine book I think available. So I have, you know, the Wine Follies of the World and the Wine Bibles, and they're all great books. They really are. And they're very informative, but sometimes they can feel really dry to read. And they're definitely not as, I think for beginners, they're not quite as friendly. So I love like the tone in your book because I've read just a little bit from each section. Obviously, I'm going to go back and read the whole thing, but haven't had time yet. Um, But just from like the chapter titles alone, and then where you start each section, it seems so approachable. And I think that's what is really important for everybody to know. Um, You know, when you're learning about wine, it can be approachable as as really, it it does sometimes seem really scary, because it's like, there's so much information out there. Um, So the way you break it down and everything, I, I think you've done a great job. And One question that I had for you, um, just based on the way it's laid out, you kind of have it laid out by different types of wine, the parts of the world, like old world, new world. Um, Have you been to a lot of those places yourself or is that something that you've kind of just done tons of research on from here? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I've traveled a lot. I've been to a lot of the regions covered in the book, certainly not every single one, just because it sort of spans the entire globe. Um, and certainly I had planned to do more travel and more research uh, in person in the before times before <laughs> the world imploded and nobody's traveling anywhere. Um, but I mean, yeah, mostly um, 
I've been to all of the regions in uh, the United States and you know throughout Europe. Um, haven't really been down much to South America or Australia or New Zealand, but uh, you know, one day. That's a long flight from uh, New York down to Australia, <laughs> so I can understand why that would be hard, especially with everything going on right now to get down there and do that research. Now, approaching this book for a reader, how did you envision someone going into it? Did you really want them to go in with an open mind and say, oh, I want to learn about the wines of France because the way it's broken down sort of by region and not necessarily kind of like you said, almost like a wine bottle or like a dictionary where, oh, Chardonnay, let's learn about Chardonnays. Uh, what was the vision with that? Um, I mean, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it's broken down by region because the way that I, and I think a lot of people think about wine is, is place. Like if you wanted to say, okay, we can write about Chardonnay, but it's almost meaningless as a data point without talking about where Chardonnay, uh, the Chardonnay in question is from, right? So Chardonnay in Chablis and Burgundy is super different stylistically than Chardonnay from California. Um, and so to me, the real window into understanding stylistic differences in wine, diversity in wine and identity in wine is, is through the window of, of place. So I think it was really important um, to try to focus on the, you know, uh, on that aspect of, of place or terroir. Yeah. I think it's really helpful for a reader who, you know, so, I shouldn't just say a reader, but a consumer who's going out to buy wines and, and you look at the shelf and there's anything from a, you know, really low end $6 wine to a wine upwards of, you know, $1,000 and, and over really, I mean, they kind of just range like crazy. Uh, so a lot of people might not feel comfortable with, like, I go in the store and there's so much to pick from, I'm like, what can I pick? So I also love that I don't see in many books that you really break it out by their value. Um, I think that that's really helpful because that's not something that you see often. So for you, I'm sure you've tried tons of wines just Study, researching for this book and writing about wines and working in the industry and all that. Um, I really think it's helpful that you've kind of broken them out in that value way. So for somebody who's walking in the store for the first time, how would you, or not for the first time, but really intentionally for the first time, how would you recommend they go about choosing the wines that they are going to put on their table? That is a really good question. Um, specifically with value in mind or just, you know, in general? I'd say in general. Okay. Well, I mean, first of all, I think, as you mentioned, Bianca, it can be really intimidating. So I think first, just like drink what you like. Don't be, there's no right wine or wrong wine. It's the, the right wine is the wine that you have open and that you're drinking. Um, and so I, I think that uh, really like your um, wine merchant is your, is your best friend. Of course, you can read my book and if something, you know, uh, uh, catches your interest and you decide you want to, you know, decide, you know, that you're going to look at the wines of France and there's a region in particular that catches your mind and you want to sort of get to know that, I'd say, you know, you can go to the store with that in mind, talk to the person there and, and get a recommendation. But um, really, I think that what's really empowering is um, just developing like a basic vocabulary to talk about what you like. So if there is a wine in question that you've loved in the past, um, you know, learn more about that, read up about that. Um, what's the grape? Um, how is it made? Where does it come from? Then you can go into the store with that as a, as a reference point and look at the, you know, that corner of the shop um, and see what else is there. Or, you know, you can talk to the wine merchant and say, I really loved, um, you know, this Pinot Noir from Oregon. And then they might say, well, you should really try one from Burgundy. And I mean, you know, it's just like, it almost doesn't matter where your avenue of entry is. It, it, you, once you're just in there and, you know, exploring and get creative and just start to pay attention to what you're, what you're drinking, it kind of just takes off uh, with a life of its own. At least that's what it was like for me. And when it comes to their regionality, do you find that a lot of the wines obviously are paired with more local cuisine or anything? Do you dive into food pairings or anything like that? And uh, do you suggest, let's say I'm making uh, a French dish tonight, would you suggest diving into the book and trying to find something in that region that might match up? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's that old cliche, what uh, grows together goes together. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're, um, if you're, if you're, you know, cooking something that's uh, like beef bourguignon and you want to drink burgundy with it, that, that would be a logical thing or an Alsatian dish or, um, you know, Italian cuisine. Um, and I mean, it gets really, 
it gets really uh, interesting because, you know, like all of these countries and their cuisines, you know, there are regional cuisines. There's no such thing as like Italian cuisine. There's Northern, there's the cuisine from Sicily, Campania, and there are wines that are native to those places that grew up with those dishes. So you can really kind of, um, you know, geek out and start to think about um, food and wine in this really local way um, that to me is really rewarding and fun. Now, being sort of so versed in research into wine, is that something you find a lot with yourself, whether you're going out for a meal or you're going out making food yourself? Do you pay attention a lot to what you're pairing with what? Oh, yeah, I drive my wife insane because I can't go to a restaurant. I will look at the wine list first and then decide what I'm drinking or what we're drinking, obviously, with her input um, and then order just based on that. So um, it really it, the wine list is the first in, uh, consideration always. And um, I, I especially if we're, if we're with a group, I can be really annoying because I'll just be looking at the wine list and not talking to anybody for the first 20 minutes until I figure it out. Um, so that's usually how it goes. So um, maybe I'll just give my wife a shout out for her patience. <laughs> And one of the things that I loved about the book is the illustrations. So I would love to give a shout out to your illustrator because they are beautiful. So well done. He did an incredible job. Yeah, Alex Green, he's an illustrator based in London. Um, he did such an incredible job. So for you, having tried and, and really, you know, knowing so much about wine, I imagine that you have some favorites. Are there any bottles that you specifically reach for without even, you know, if you're, if you're just looking for a drinking wine that you're like, all right, I just feel like, you know, this is my go-to cab Cabernet, or this is my good go-to like Sauvignon Blanc. Like, do you have those select few that you always go back for? Yeah. Um, and again, it's just based on value. Um, so I drink a lot of Beaujolais, which is getting more expensive, but um, just like a basic Beaujolais village um, kind of goes with everything, light bodied Gamay from France, like that's just sort of a house wine. Um, I always have kind of just like a crisp Italian white around, um, you know, whether it's from the coast um, uh, or I don't know, there are so many, there are so many options, it's a hard question. Um, and then um, uh, I drink a lot of bubbles. Um, so uh, especially now I'm writing a second book about sparkling wine. Um, so, you know, always have to have the house uh, bubbly. Can't really drink champagne every night, um, but I drink a lot of uh, Cremant, which is um, uh, the French term for sparkling wine made in the champagne method outside of champagne. Uh, so there's some really great values there in terms of just like a house bubbly. The other thing I would say is um, Muscadet for, for whites uh, from the Loire Valley. Um, just crisp, mineral, beautiful, and, and very value-driven uh, wine. So that's kind of always a, a staple of the rotation. And is that something that you always planned on was to write another book or was that something that you were inspired to do after you wrote this one? Well, it was a two book deal. So it was, it was in the cards from the start, yeah. And do you ever venture outside of wines and drink other, maybe even sort of grape uh, liquors like a grappa or a brandy or something like that? Or do you kind of tend to stick to wines? No, I love spirits. Um, I, I have, I'm an avid spirits drinker and lover. Um, I do love brandy. I think it's probably not a coincidence that my favorite spirits are grape based. Um, so I love, you know, Armagnac and cognac and grappas, but um, I drink a lot of Calvados, like apple brandy. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I just, if it's fermented and, you know, whether it's distilled or not, and it has a sense of place, um, you know, I'm, I'm into it. What have been some of your favorite experiences uh, with wine so far? Like, ha I'm sure since you have, you know, visited a lot of places and you've worked a lot of different places, what have you felt are some of the most valuable? Honestly, this sounds really cheesy, but it's just being together with friends over a bottle of wine and just sort of that um, that social connection uh, that, it, that it facilitates. I mean, I've had really wonderful experiences traveling places and being in the vineyards and talking to winemakers, um, especially, you know, being invited into the homes of winemakers, meeting their families and just seeing how wine is um, just such a, a part of everyday life. Um, it's not this, you know, uh, intimidating, rarefied, exclusive thing, but it's it's just a grocery and it's something that people gather around. And um, to me, that's what makes it, uh, you know, so enjoyable and, and rewarding. 
And in these visits and these uh, experiences we had, have you ever gotten to kind of go behind the doors of the kitchen, if you will, and really see how the wine is made and get to experience any of that yourself? Yes. Um, I mean, generally, I've not ever like made wine in any capacity, but you know, I visited wineries like during harvest and things, but I mean, to be, to be fair, um, like I, I have not ever, uh, you know, done, like I, I definitely haven't harvested grapes and done the backbreaking labor. Um, so I guess I can't really say that. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I, I don't yeah, know. no, it totally does. It's just uh, funny. Some other people that we've talked to that are obviously they're more into wine making. They they're right. winemakers that we've discussed with before. But a lot of them start with this uh, idea like they're just getting into wine, and then they'll go live in France for a year and make wine and you know right. learn. So I was just curious if you had any experiences like that. Yeah, I've never like worked harvest or done that. I, I would actually like to because I, I actually find that um, you know, especially for this book too, it's like it's in order to sort of write about how wine is made without having make it having made it before it, it can be a challenge required a lot of research I feel like like there's no substitute for actually like doing the thing itself so I, I think I would probably learn a lot and a lot of things that I know abstractly would click into place if I actually did go make wine at some point yeah yeah and that's something we've learned a lot in this podcast talking to winemakers and spirit distillers and everything there's certain things that you take for granted that oh you know this is red, this is white, this is pink, but you know, really getting into the, what goes into that, it starts to make a lot more sense when they're breaking it down. Like, oh, well we do this and we do this. And that's why this happened. That's why you see that. And even just knowing a little bit more about how they're made and what goes into that process will give you a lot of insight into, oh, this wine's going to be like this because of all these factors that they lay out. But yeah, there's like a million stylistic choices and, and decisions that go into what ends up in your glass. And the more you know about that, the more empowered you are, I think, to drink what you like because you have a, a vocabulary for talking about it. Yeah. And outside of books, we're all at home right now and we love yeah. all everything, shows, movies, and there's so much on wine that's out there. What are some of your favorite things to watch or other forms of entertainment that relate to the wine industry that aren't necessarily reading? Other than drinking. Um, <laughs> and drinking. <laughs> that's, that is a good question. Um, I hope I don't really draw a blank. I mean, this is, it's a documentary that came out a long time ago, but there's an incredible documentary called Mondo Vino by Jonathan Nossiter, uh, where he travels pretty much all over the world looking at small uh, sort of family artisanal wineries. It's sort of a, um, uh, almost a manifesto in favor of, um, you know, uh, small scale, uh, place driven, uh, you know, wine as opposed to sort of the globalization of wine. So that's a great documentary. Um, um, I'm trying to think of other things. Um, I mean, there are books that I love and there are definitely, um, you know, some podcasts that are good, but um, I think drinking wine is really the best part. I mean, we can agree with that. <laughs> Reading the labels when the bottle's empty. That's... <laughs> Yes, and talking about it on the podcast after we've after we've had it. <laughs> uh, are there any particular regions that if you had to pick one out of all the whole book, which one would you gravitate towards if you had to choose one for the rest of your life? I couldn't do it, except I guess if I had to, um, I keep I keep bringing up the Loire Valley um, just because I think it, you know it really is uh, the most diverse region in France, kind of does everything uh, from dry to sweet, red, white, rosé. Um, <laughs> oh, that's my dog. He likes the Loire too. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I guess that's what I would what I would choose, but I would hate to be in that position. And of the, uh, of the American and North American viticultural zones and everything, do you tend to have a favorite here, whether it's California, Oregon, even up in uh, Canada, like Ontario? That's a really good question. I mean, um, I drink a lot of wine from California, but it's like California is so big, you know, so it's like where in California. Um, but I will say like recently, um, I've just been really, really loving as, as obvious as this sounds, just like going back to the classics um, and drinking like Oregon, like just Willamette Pinot Valley, uh, ugh, Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, um, but also just like really good Napa Cabernet. Um, I feel like, you know, um, a lot of industry people like, you know, they steer away from some of those classic reference points, but it's really helpful to kind of go back to them and be like, wait, why is, 
Napa Cabernet, like such a thing. And there's some really, really great um, wineries uh, and younger people, um, you know, making awesome, awesome wines. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I've, I've kind of been revisiting the classics uh, of the United States recently. Yeah, we've been learning so much about, I mean, everywhere, everywhere really, but for the most part, we've had quite a few wineries um, in, you know, mostly we're all in North America right now. So it's um, for me and Nick, I think you don't even realize how many wineries there really are until you've now talked to somebody in like all these different areas within a state. And it's unbelievable. Like there's thousands and thousands of them. Um, yeah. But it's incredible because they're all doing something so different. So I think that's been the most fun for us um, from reading about wine and learning about it. And it's the same thing with the other spirits that uh, we cover on the podcast. It's just, it's so interesting to learn about. I think right now while we're, you know, all at home and we are not really going out, it's it's fun to experiment at home with those different uh, drinks that we're talking about. So uh, we will definitely be using the book to use for our future wine drinking. <laughs> and, um, and I know it'll be good for you, Nick, especially since you're still learning, I think. I'm a novice. Music. Yep. Yeah. And it's just, it's great lending to the theme of the book too. Some of the people that we've talked to, whether it's uh, Case Springs in Canada, uh, the area that they're in is very, very uh, viable for Rieslings. So they make excellent Rieslings and they come out of there. We've talked to people in Willamette Valley, uh, Great Oregon Wine Company, I believe is the name of the uh, people yes. out there. Yep, that's <laughs> right. Uh, they're Pinot Noir. And that's something that not being a big wine drinker, I would just think, ah, Pinot Noir, probably European. I don't know, it comes from anywhere. Uh, but I'm learning so much about why that specific region is so great for that type of wine. Like you said, cabs in Napa. Uh, and just people from outside of that too. And we've talked to people down in Texas. We've talked to people all over the country and everyone has something with their viticultural zones that makes the wine so special coming out of there. That's the point. I mean, otherwise it would be really boring. Um, exactly. And, you know, you raised a good point, Bianca. It's like, we can't really travel now, but I think you can drink wines from different places and it's sort of a way to bring parts of the outside world into your lockdown. I mean, at least for me, it, ha it has been, it's like some variety <laughs> at least. Yeah. Definitely. Kind of like the world through a bottle. Yep. You can uh, kind of really experiment. Uh, Bianca and I both love to cook and love to experiment with different recipes and things. So, you know, you take a night and theme it. Like I'll make a paella and pair it up with a Rioja or something from uh, Spain, the regional. And now not getting super deep into wh what region in Spain is coming from, but just, you know, general countrywide. But there's so many things you could do with that just to kind of make it a little bit more special and give yourself sort of a theme for the night. Yeah. I mean, that's how I taught myself how to cook was you know, not really being able to afford going to restaurants in graduate school and but wanting to drink wines with the cuisine that goes with them. So you kind of have to figure it out. Yeah. And what are some of the newer, or I shouldn't say newer, but what are some of the winemakers that you're most fond of in this, like in the U.S.? Do you have any or you can't name them because there's too many? <laughs> in the U.S. specifically? Yeah, yeah I think so. There's too uh, many around the world, so <laughs> there are wouldn't make you do that. <laughs> yeah, there are, I mean, there are so, so many in the U.S. Um, who comes to mind? Well, I, I have sparkling wine on, on the brain uh, recently um, for, the, for the book, and I think there's like a really interesting new wave of sparkling wines coming out of California. Um, Michael Cruz is one winemaker who's uh, kind of behind that. Um, he makes a wine called Ultramarine. That's really incredible, but he makes some more... Um, you know, inexpensive sparkling wines, um, you know, as well. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, read, read my book because they're all in there. That's what I'll say, actually. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. And what if, I think what, one thing that comes to mind for most people when they think of wine is cheese. So are you also somebody who studies and looks into cheese when you're pairing with your wines or are you not as into that category of things? I really like cheese, um, but I, I don't know nearly as much about cheese as I, as I do about wine. I mean, like I know the basic cheeses and I'll, I'll, if I'm drinking something, I'll try to go to the wine store, uh, not the wine store, the cheese shop and like pick out something that seems like it comes from where that wine is from. But uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a cheese expert. <laughs> Bianca is charcuterie obsessed every time. She's my, she's my sister. So every time we have a uh, 
family get get together, whether it's four people or 20 people, there's always this crazy spread of cheeses and meats that she always brings along with her wine. So she definitely dives into that. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, you can't go wrong with wine and cheese. Everybody likes it. So if you're going to a group gathering or you're having a group gathering, I mean, what does everybody like? You, you don't really disappoint anybody when you have a spread like that. <laughs> 100%. Is there anything else that you want a reader to know going into the book that we haven't touched on uh, or something that they should take away that might entice Mo to go pick up this book? Um, I guess just the sort of general uh, idea that now is really the greatest time to be a wine drinker um, than ever before. Like there's just so much choice out there. There's such a diversity of styles and regions and things. It can really be intimidating to navigate through all of that on the other hand. Um, but like, we've just never had uh, the opportunity to drink so well and so broadly. Um, so I would say just like, don't worry about, um, you know, not knowing this or that or feeling intimidated, just like get out there and just start drinking. And, and I think, you know, um, that's really what the book is there uh, to do um, is to try to help uh, sort of provide a sense of context and guidance through this um, ever expanding kind of chaotic world of wine um, uh, so that, you know, you can steer yourself towards whatever it is that you like. And I know um, it's become in the past few years increasingly easier to get wines delivered directly to you, even whether it's one bottle or a case of it. I know there's a particular wine that I had at a restaurant that I couldn't find for the longest time that I ended up ordering a case because I found some down in New Jersey. So I had that delivered. Um, but Speaking of delivering, how can people get their hands in your book? Where is it available online or in stores? It's pretty much available everywhere. Um, it's on um, like Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I think it's like uh, you can get it through the publisher, which is, um, you know, Penguin Random House, 10 Speed Press. Um, yeah, it's like in, on the Target website and Walmart even, but don't don't buy it from Walmart if you, if you can help it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 there wherever books are sold, I guess. Perfect, and we will put a link to the book. Uh, we'll, we'll pick one. Nick, you gonna pick one? <laughs> I usually do three. Uh, in recent books that we featured, it's usually like Amazon, Indiegogo, I don't know if you're available, or IndieBound. That's what it is. IndieBound is a, a North American online book retailer, Barnes & Noble. I usually link some, the big three that they advertise. If you have a website, uh, I'll pick top three on there and <laughs> throw them in the description. So <laughs> you can find them. People can use whatever they prefer, you know, whatever they have an account with or whatever that they get their reward points. So fantastic. Well, thank All you. All right. Yeah, we had such a great time talking to you tonight. Uh, thank you. We look forward to reading more of this book and learning a lot more about wines from it. And we look forward to talking to you again in the future. Sounds great. Thank you guys again for having me. It was really fun. Have a good night. Be sure to follow us on social at Uncorked Corner and on the blog at uncorkedcorner.com for a taste of more food and beverage content. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe, rate, and review on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Thanks for listening.